Good morning. I'm Dana Marie McNichol. Thank you so much for watching our Innovate 8 special today, sponsored by UC San Diego. Now, throughout the next half hour, we're going to introduce you to some inspiring young innovators who really do make a difference in STEM fields here in San Diego and across the world. Let's start off by telling you about the Tech Angels. Getting our aging population to stay on top of all the latest technology can really be a challenge, but a group of tech-savvy North County boys, they're up to the task. They've already helped hundreds of our seniors in nursing homes and senior centers by teaching them how to use phones, to get crucial medical information, also stay connected to family and friends. After learning about the Tech Angels recently, CBS 8's Eric Connor decided to see them in action. How about deleting unwanted? They're not sporting wings, but these tech angels are helping seniors take off in the tech world by helping them navigate apps and websites. They all have like similar problems, like not knowing how to use technology, so we just want to help with that. 14-year-old Keanu Seeliger, along with his brothers, came up with the idea at the start of the pandemic when no one could visit his 96-year-old grandmother in her nursing home. So we figured that other people must have the same issue. So that's how we got the idea to start Tech Angels. On this day, the Seeliger boys and some of their friends they've recruited are helping teach tech at Auberge Senior Living Community in San Diego. I would want to like share my knowledge and what I know with others so that they can know more. Well, I encourage older people to use uh, apps where you can uh, talk to your loved ones. Harriet Prenner says her grown-up children and even grandkids have been too busy lately to help her with her devices, so the tech angels swooped in at the right time. And I learned how to attach pictures to my emails and put them in on Facebook as well. I'm never going to do Twitter, but you know, I'll go as far as email. That way I can check up and see what my family is doing all over the country. Harriet's husband, Bruce, says the tech angels helped him spread his Wi-Fi wings. I thought that the young, per young person was great, showed me exactly what to do, and reminded me that I had to get the Wi-Fi in the area. They were not shy. That was the other thing about them. You know, just because we're older, they were very pleasant. Bob Brown's been trying to find a way to send a mass message to his buddies about a monthly get-together. Tech angels to the rescue. Younger people are not afraid of their phone and they'll they'll hit the buttons and move all over the place. Older people are afraid to mess something up majorly uh, by hitting a button. Uh, I'm in between. Nope, it's not how most teenage boys spend their weekend afternoons, but you might say that tech angels have a higher calling. I just want to teach people how to get more comfortable using technology and just try to learn more. But it's also nice to know that I might be able to help them with some of their questions. Such big hearts those boys have. The Tech Angels offer more than just help. Oftentimes they bring slightly used phones and devices to give the seniors, also to keep them connected with loved ones. Tech Angels could use your help, whether you're willing to give donations or donate a device. We put the contact information on the online version of this story at CBS8.com. Now, San Diego kids, they're learning about the science of protecting and maintaining a PGA golf course. Local STEM students from Millennial Tech Middle School were at Torrey Pines learning the science behind habitats, water, and conservation. CBS 8, Abby Black reports. Torrey Pines is one of the most spectacular courses in the country. Local students are learning that it takes a lot of hard work and science to maintain this beautiful patch of grass. From cutting the perfect hole. Learning that under like all the grass there's sand and like how like what it takes to make it. To the type of sand. It does look like crystals. Yeah. Seventh grader Henry Anderson didn't think much about the science of keeping up the green. When I pass by a golf course and I'm like, oh, it's just a big patch of grass. It probably doesn't take that much, just like watering it every day or whatever. He and 70 other seventh grade students from Millennial Tech are getting a hands-on experience on what it takes to maintain a PGA golf course during the week of the Farmers Open at Torrey Pines Golf Course. That it takes over 80, um, 80 different tractors. This innovative outreach program known as the First Green is hosted by the Golf Course Superintendents Association of America, which focuses on STEM principles. The soils are different. It's a golf course, but it's not just a golf course. It's a big environment. That encompasses protected habitats. I see that you actually have to make sure that the, wild, that the wildlife is protected, that the grass is different heights. Matt Partridge teaches the students about conservation. You know, golf courses get 
at times, you know, a little bit of bad stigma, especially with our water situation here in, in Southern California and things like that. But that's us as golf course superintendents, that's one of our main jobs is we manage everything. This is an environmental learning lab that's creating opportunities for Michaela Flores, who's interested in agricultural engineering. During the summertime, they use this special kind of palette to spray on the grass if it doesn't have enough moisture or water on it. But the birdie of the day? Uh, so my family's always believed in me. And PGA Tour players Michael Herrera and Ricky Fowler schooled the students about life. It gets tough out here. You know, it's it's not all uh, it's not all just fun and easy and you're not always playing well. So it's more about how you deal with the tough times. This real life experience is giving students a closer look at this environmental landmark. So now that I know it's like a lot more to it than just watering your grass every day. At Torrey Pines Golf Course, I'm Abby Black, CBS 8. Coming up, more and more students are immersing themselves in the metaverse. We get a look inside a virtual reality classroom. Then artificial intelligence is developing at a rapid pace. Details on how researchers are using the technology to read minds. Welcome back, I'm Dana Marie McNichol, and you're watching an Innovate 8 special. Students from all over the world, they're immersing themselves in the metaverse, trading traditional lessons for virtual ones. How Britain has launched its first virtual reality classroom. Ian Lee reports from London. Putting your thinking cap on in this classroom means strapping on a virtual headset, a window into the digital world where anything can happen. That Saturn is way too big. It needs to come back down, please. From exploring the planets to visiting world-renowned museums. There's a deeper understanding because they can manipulate an object, they can see it from all sides, they can see how it works. These British students log into their Metaverse school, connecting them with classmates from around the world. The Metaverse school is a digital twin, an exact copy of this building in virtual reality that brings together students from all around the world to be taught in virtual reality. So 84 different schools in 24 different countries. Using VR, not the magic school bus, they can shrink down to investigate the human body. Up close to you. It was really cool how I got to put the heart in a different place because if, if you were in a normal classroom, you can't do that. Some of the most impressive things we can do are science experiments that would otherwise be impossible or too dangerous to do in a classroom. The technology can also help the past come alive. We've used it in history to go back in time, experience things like World War II from the ground. By bringing lessons to life, teachers say students learn more while literally reaching for the stars. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. ChatGBT is good for more than just writing essays. Artificial intelligence researchers in Texas, they're experimenting with reading minds. Donnie Sullivan allowed himself to be a guinea pig in this fascinating AI experiment. You're reading people's minds. So we don't like to use the term mind reading. These neuroscientists at the University of Texas in Austin say they've made a major breakthrough. They've figured out how to translate brain activity into words using artificial intelligence. These are different images. Earlier this month, they published a paper explaining how they had researched volunteers listen to audio clips while having their brain scanned by an fMRI machine. Over time, AI algorithms, the very same tech that's behind ChatGPT, were able to figure out what the volunteers were listening to just by watching their brains. It is just crazy. You can watch how blood flows through the brain mm -hmm. and using AI and GBT and everything else translated into words. Yeah, it's wild that this works when you put it that way. Thumbs up, Tony. To test it all out, Professor Alexander Hoot and I had our brain scanned while listening to parts of the Wizard of Oz audiobook. Chinip, I only had a brain. Big brain. Yeah. Like obnoxiously big. All right, Danny, we have a picture of your brain. I so, have a brain. Yep, it looks good. I was scanned first, followed by Professor Hoot, capturing images of the changes in our brain's blood flow as we listened to the words from the audiobook and showing how our brains interpreted those words. When she had finished her meal and was about to go back to the road of yellow brick, she was startled to hear a deep groan nearby. You can see that they're getting recordings every two seconds. While he's listening to a story, we will feed this data through our decoder and try to predict the story that he's currently listening to. The next morning, the results were in. Okay, so it's been 24 hours since we got our brain scanned. You can confirm I have a brain. 
Absolutely. Brilliant. So we were able to decode some stuff from my brain, not so much from yours. So uh, this is one from my brain. This is from The Wizard of Oz. So on the left side is the actual words that uh, I heard. When she had finished her meal and was about to go back to the road of yellow brick, she was startled to hear a deep groan nearby. And the decoded version of this is on the right. It's, I was about to head back to school and I hear this strange voice calling out to me. So it gets some things right. So this like was about to go back, was about to head back. It completely misses some things like mm -hmm. the road of yellow brick versus school. But then it gets this, uh, this nice kind of example. So she hears something and then instead of a deep groan nearby, it said a strange voice calling out to me. It means sure. something related, even if it's not exactly the right words. Still pretty incredible to think that was about to head back is something that just by scanning your brain. <laughs> yeah. I think that's one of the things that's really surprising to us about this. It can get things like that. It can get these entire phrases of exact words. Mm. Okay, so here's this same segment for you. Now, so we expected mine not to be great. Because we haven't trained the model on you. The whole day I'd be fine, but she wanted me to make it to her place. First, I got a little excited about it. <laughs> The reason it wasn't able to decode my brain was because the technology currently needs people to sit in the fMRI machine for more than 16 hours so the AI models can train on specific people's brains. Are we going to live in a world where, you know, I can walk by somebody on the street and they'll be able to hold something up to my head and they'll know what I'm thinking? Currently, we're very far from that. That might also never be possible. We can't completely rule it out, but as far as we know, that certainly won't be possible in the next few decades. The real potential application of this is actually helping people who are unable to speak without them needing to get neurosurgery. Now we have this like snapshot of the brain. And Jerry Tang explained how they used OpenAI's GPT large language model to help decode the brain. The GPT model is made up of millions of pages of text from the internet that the AI trains on and learns how sentences are constructed and how people talk and think. GPT basically made our predictions a lot better. But it doesn't just work listening to audio. Professor Hoot showed us what happened when he watched a movie with no sound while his brain was scanned. Watch as the technology is able to decode what his eyes are seeing. She then took my hand and held it to her lips. She kissed it. I smiled and oh my she pulled God. me in for a hug. I got her back for about hours. I had to stop the bleeding and gave her my shirt to put over it. It's pretty good. I don't know, it's, it's a pretty That's good description of what was happening here. Wow. Should we be scared by the work people like you are doing? We think it's really important to continually evaluate um, the implications of brain decoding and also to start thinking about enacting policies that protect mental privacy and regulate what brain data can be used for. While the research is far from being applied to everyday use, it does provide a glimpse into how companies may be able to develop more robust virtual assistants to help patients as well as consumers. Coming up after the break, how a new event is inspiring young local girls to continue their education in STEM. Seventy-one percent of careers need STEM skills, according to the American Heart Association, but not many women have these jobs. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen tells us about a new event that hopes to inspire young local girls to continue their education and land a job in science, technology, engineering, or math. The American Heart Association held a first-time event to inspire more than 50 local female students to get into careers in STEM. I met with one of the mentors from the event. Louise Brandy is in charge of technology at Quidel Ortho, a medical device company in Sorrento Valley. She says she puts the T in STEM, which stands for Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. A source of her determination behind her work comes from her late husband, Michael. He had four strokes before he died of cardiovascular disease in 2019. We were married for close to 28 years. He died one day before our anniversary. He walked not only marathons, he walked nine full and 15 halves. He also walked across the country to show stroke survivors that there's life after stroke. Michael's struggle with heart health is what drives Brandy to inspire young girls from Castle Park High School in the Sweetwater Union School District to land a career in STEM. The importance about STEM is that we need more and more women in this industry. 
over half of our jobs are filled by women, but less than 25% are in the STEM arena. That means we are way undersourced with women in these areas. And of the girls that go to college, 12 out of 100 of them are only getting a degree in the STEM-related fields. And of that, only three of them get a job in STEM. So we're trying to close the gap there. In a first time STEM Goes Red event, Brandy, along with the American Heart Association, showed these local high school students hands-on work with robotics, how to decompose a COVID-19 test, and more STEM-related activities, in hopes that one day more girls will be eager to major in STEM-related fields in college and eventually impact the world. Women don't always know that they can. So to meet other women who have done it and who have paved the way to say, hey, we'll compete in a male dominated area that we actually find it easier to do. STEM Goes Red will become an annual event. They plan to hold another one this fall where female students will get continued mentorship. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Coming up after the break, reptiles, robots, and science experiments. We're going to take a look at San Diego's Festival of Science and Engineering. Well, welcome back. Now, leave it to a bunch of smart eighth graders to design the perfect city of the future to fly climate change. CBS 8's Jeff Zevely visits St. Michael's School in Poway to behold Lotus City. I'm no expert, but any city with a beautiful Hawaiian beach and a Costco sounds pretty good to me. Does your city have water? Yes. yes. When designing perfection, does your city have electricity? Yes. yes. You first assemble a team of eighth grade STEM all-stars. Hi, I'm Addie. I'm Sophia. I'm Cami. I'm Ava. I'm Aurelia. I'm Penelope. You then begin with the basics. And it's powered by magnets. Public transportation and energy created by the ocean. What makes Lotus City stand out above the rest? The carbon intake buildings. They're painted with titanium monoxide, which is a chemical that attracts carbon in the atmosphere. Once the carbon goes through the building, it's turned into calcium carbonate, which is then turned into bricks and concrete. Not only will Lotus City take on climate change, but with all of those bricks? In the future, when our population rises, we can expand our city and build more buildings. So along with solving the housing crisis? There's three buoyant titanium tanks located underneath the city and they lift it above the sea level. These students want to float another idea by you. Lotus City is what? A floating city. A floating city. Yes. Out in the middle of the sea? No, it's located off the coast of Ni'ihau, Hawaii, and it's a man-made island. Southern California. The team took Lotus to the Future City competition. Lotus! <laughs> and beat out 19 other schools. Were you surprised by the victory? Uh, we weren't surprised because we prepared really hard for it. St. Michael's teachers Laura Ray and Crystal Moss Say the future looks bright. I'm excited that it's an all-female team in STEM. I think that that's something to be really proud of. The students also included a worship center. The worship center is where everyone in the entire city comes together. People of all faiths welcome. Proud teachers. Proud Very teachers. proud. And we're not done. Now we get to go to Washington, D.C. and compete in a global competition. In Washington, D.C., they all face teams from around the world. We're definitely going there to win something. Especially if the judges like to shop. You've thought of everything, apparently, because you also included a Costco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When designing perfection, you might as well surround it with paradise. Thank you for saving the planet. And also, thank you for that little beach over there, because when I visit, I'm going to be hanging out there. It's called the Cove. <laughs> no city can compete with our beach. In the Zevely Zone. Lotus City! Jeff Zevely, CBS 8. How oh, cool. All right, reptiles, robots, and science experiments are filling up Petco Park. CBS 8's Ariana Cohen reports on the San Diego Festival of Science and Engineering. Expo Day is back at Petco Park for the first time since 2020. There's dozens of hands-on experiments. Check out this robot named Viper that was made by local high school students. 
reptiles, science experiments, robots, and more. Rockets, robots, reptiles, explosions, there's all kinds of cool things. You're making slime, you're grabbing DNA, uh, riding electric bikes, listening to our performances by our rapping mathematicians. Everything's here. It's an amazing day. Families and children enjoyed more than 100 exhibits at the 15th annual San Diego Festival of Science and Engineering. The goal of the free event at Petco Park is to teach students more about STEAM, science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. These three Magnolia Science Academy students showed me their experiment. The chemical reaction of turning liquid into CO2 to make gas to, and showing how you can shoot it out by engineering. Check out the Curiosity Cube, a shipping container turned into an interactive mobile science lab. These Del Norte High School students built this robot from scratch in just six weeks, proving that these experimental activities can be future career paths for students. So when we do get into the real world, like after college, um, when we go into actual engineering fields, we have that experience and it just is an opportunity for us to um, explore our passions and interests. As high schoolers, it's really important to get this experience at a young age so that we can apply it later on in life. The event inspires young explorers, painters, and thinkers to one day change the world. You can change the world, so just to expand your knowledge, when you expand your knowledge, you can expand your community's knowledge and you have the power to change the world. Ariana Cohen, CBS 8. Young minds doing absolutely incredible things. Our future is very bright. Thank you so much for tuning in to our Innovate 8 special. I'm Dana Marie McNichol. Tune in until next time.